we have each character's instrument or snippets of his theme on top of the going merry blending all together. So, so it's all about creating that dialogue. Just as there is a dialogue on screen, there is a dialogue happening musically. And that's what makes all of this cohesive and unified. Like one, in one piece. In one piece, yes. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Thank you for, for taking the time. Clearly today. we're doing not so well. <laughs> no, we're doing well. <laughs> we're doing, we're doing great. <laughs> I literally, the first question that I had written down to ask you was like, the soundtrack is four hours long. Are you okay? Like, like how are you standing? How are you like, <laughs> like able to do anything? I can't even imagine the amount of work that you all did on this. Like it's, it's unbelievable. And not just us, it's also like the Greg Hayes, the mix engineers, uh, Dave Colling, the mastering engineer, everybody. Every soloist, every artist, Aurora, Marcin, Flawless Real Talk, Wonder Girl, our orchestrators, the whole team, the music prep team, like literally the whole music department. They are such rock stars. Like we are so grateful for this fantastic team because we couldn't have done this without any any of these people and any of these incredible artists and four hours long. And that's actually great because like, if we're talking about a feature film, right? Usually when you release the soundtrack, it's about three quarters lengths of the film, right? Three quarters of the score. In this case, it's probably not even half of what we wrote for the show. It's in fact, a very, very condensed version of what we wrote for the show. And, and I think it was, you know, we knew it was very important for the fans to have as much of the music released because you know every two episodes we are we are meeting new villains we are in new islands so we're like we need to include all the different themes from all the from all the islands all the different themes from all the villains in fact it's a it's a very character driven show right we have our straw heads there are five of them these are our main characters but then as Jonas said there are all these incredible villains and every character in this show is very unique in terms of their thematic material, in terms of their instrumentation, in terms of their themes. So not giving that to the fans, like we would have been receiving so much backlash right now. I'll tell you more. When we didn't include, when we did The Witcher, we had the song called The Song of the White Wolf, which plays in two versions. It plays with a solo violin at the end of the episode, and then it plays with the vocals performed by Declan Debar in the end credits. Well, we just included the end credits with the, with the vocals. We're still hearing back about that, <laughs> that we did not include the solo violin version. It's the same exact piece of music, just the solo violin version. We're still hearing that from the fans. So hell yeah, four hours long. Yeah, it was imperative for us to release as much as we could. <laughs> did your experience on The Witcher make you feel like even more pressure coming into this? I mean, I'm sure you already had so much. I know you liked One Piece, like you were a fan already. Like, were you worried of what people were gonna say and think and everything? No, I don't think I, so. Hey, here's the thing. Like, while working on One Piece, yeah. you know, we were writing because we're huge fans of One Piece. We were writing like, you know, with writing as we are fans. What do we, we want to hear as fans of One Piece in One Piece? And, you know, when we were writing, we were getting excited because like this is so cool this it's because how this all started for us even before we got officially on board on the project we learned that netflix was making the live action adaptation and you know after having done the witcher so we released the witcher the album right now is at half a billion streams which is just insane and then toss a coin was number one on billboard yeah. not just in the soundtrack charts but in the rock charts uh, that was the summer when Panic at the Disco released uh, High Hopes and gotta have high hopes for her leaving, which I, I love this song. But they were number two on Billboard and we were number one, which was just insane. So after The Witcher, we were looking for our next project, the type of project that would require very unique, intricate, complex music world building. And mm -hmm. as soon as we learned about One Piece, we knew that that was the one project that was the right project for us and even before we got officially on board we actually shot a very quick like a three minute video it was a video pitch uh just because purely we just got so excited about it uh in that video we literally outlined the whole concept behind the music world building that we would create for one piece and what kind of themes we would assign to all of our characters and what kind of instruments and then at the end all the instrumentations that 
uh, that we would assign to every one of our straw hats, all of that we would combine in Luffy's theme because he's our captain and the glue of our crew. And then we played Luffy's theme and that was like a year and a half ago. So now a year and a half later, the show is out, the soundtrack is out. All those concepts that we outlined in that video and even that main theme that we came up with that became the main theme of the show and all the concepts stayed 100% true. So I don't think it was about pressure. I think it was just more about excitement and what we would want to see in a show like that and how we would want to approach this music universe. So you were writing all this before you saw scripts, before you knew any, or like you had all these ideas. How much did your musical ideas change once you saw the casting and saw these actors like, you know, embody these characters the way they do? Because they're so good. I don't think they changed at all. I don't think they changed because, you know, we're a fan of the manga and the anime. So we already had our images. And, you know, when writing, like, they better be similar to the manga because otherwise, so, <laughs> right? <laughs> and what, what the show, I think, does so well is, you know, it's uh, it was of paramount importance to all of us that the live action adaptation would have its own distinct voice and its own distinct identity, including its own distinct music identity. But at the same time, all of us wanted to remain true to the spirit and the heart of the manga. And I think, like, when we started having all these ideas, even before we were able to read the scripts or, you know, to see the cast or to see, you know, any of the rough cuts, you know, we kind of hit the mark right away, even before seeing, seeing any of that. Just because, you know, being familiar with the property and kind of understanding what the fans would want to see and hear mm. in an adaptation like that. The amount of intention you put into, like, having instruments for each of Zoro's swords, like, all the work that you... It's its amazing. Did the showrunners, like, ask for any of this? Or were they just, like, amazed at what you started doing? All of that literally comes from that video pitch. All, yeah. all of it. So, uh, we have five straw heads. And they're all so unique and so different. And yes, they're a crew, but they're not a crew quite yet, basically until we get towards the very end of this season. Mm -hmm. So it made sense that every single one of our characters would be so distinct and so different. And Matt and Steve were 100% supportive of that idea. They wanted to make every one of our characters very different and unique. And, and I feel, you know, and it was incredible that while working on the show towards you know the uh few months ago we were working on some scenes towards a few months ago well towards a few months ago no a few months ago we were you know working on some scenes and i remember uh either matt or steve coming back with, uh, with a note it's like here we're hearing the theme of this character it should be this other theme and then we're like oh my gosh they're so familiar with the themes and how they interpolate and everything and it's it gives such a amazing opportunity to have such a dialogue with them such a creative dialogue on how to interpolate it's, everything it's and... very rare because by having those themes and instruments for every one of our characters the mm. whole team like Matt and steve with tomorrow studios netflix everybody got so familiar mm. with the themes and instrumentations that it's it's very rare when you get to have such a you know an in-depth conversation you know, about all the themes and instruments, like, hey, what about using this theme over here? Or maybe we have this character on screen, but what if we use, you know, the instrument of the other character because he's just about to appear on screen? So, like, these, these are really in-depth, meaningful conversation, which all really stems from that video. And then in that video, so we outlined the instrument for every one of our characters. So we have Luffy, and that's hurdy-gurdy because what kind of... And violin, fiddle, and banjo. A little bit of fiddle and banjo, because let's be diverse, but hurdy-gurdy is at the forefront of that because it's a pirate show, so we need a hurdy-gurdy. Yeah. Uh, then we have Nami, and her instrument is flute, and we mainly have her theme performed by flute throughout the whole season before climaxing into her theme's most powerful song rendition, which is called My Sails Are Set, at the end of episode eight, performed by Aurora. Then we have Zoro. Zoro. And I absolutely love that character because musically, he gave us so many opportunities. So he has three swords. And the idea was, what if we assign a particular instrument to every single one of his swords? So the first one was Bansuri, 
And the reason behind is very simple. It's a very long Indian flute. And it was like, it looks like a sword. Every time, you know, Sonia says, you play in the wrong note, I use it as a sword. I'm like, ha fight. Uh, so, you know. <laughs> See, we're having fun at the studio. Uh, then the second instrument is a frame drum. A really big frame drum. It's like a 43-inch frame drum. We have several frame drums in the studio, but we obviously chose the biggest one because the sound is just so mighty mighty and so thick. It's it's just perfect. For one just very uncomfortable uncomfortable to hold it still trying to figure out how to hold it in front of a microphone but small details it's huge yeah. it's huge and then the third instrument is duduk which is originally an armenian instrument but zora has this sword it's called badui chimonji and it's a very particular sword that has a lot of history as a sword itself but also has a lot of personal history for zora he doesn't use it very often he only uses it on very special occasions. So having a very special instrument with kind of like a mystical and sacred quality, such as Duduk has, that was a perfect representation for that sword. And it's so cool because like, you know, every time during the episodes, Zoro reaches for the Wado Ichimonji's world, that's when we we use the Duduk coming in just for those specific moments. And it's such it's it was such a helpful idea to have an instrument for each sword because, you know, whenever we need to change a little bit the texture because you're doing something else, we have the... We have the toolbox. We have to the toolbox that. for that. Then we have Sanji, who looks very sleek, kind of very jazzy because he's wearing a black suit. His hair falls on one of his eyes, right? So he definitely has like a jazzy feel just by looking at him. So we were like, why not representing him with like a big band jazz funk fusion ensemble? And also the way he fights, he uses kick-based martial arts. So, you know, Sanji is there kicking and then Jonah is here. We've, we were thinking, well, if we follow that with such cool drum grooves, jazzy drum grooves, and we're like, that's going to be cool. So Sanji is kicking there and Jonah is kicking right here. <laughs> Works just fine. Uh, and then we have Usopp, who, as of right now, he's still cowardly. And his biggest dream is to become the bravest pirate out there. So as of right now, his instrument is an ukulele. And it's actually a bluesy ukulele. There is no such genre, really, but there is now in one piece because there are no boundaries in this universe. Yeah. So for now, we have it as an ukulele. And then as in further seasons, Usopp is going to grow as the character and become braver and stronger. His instrument literally was all, will also start growing. And from a small ukulele, we'll keep going bigger, bigger, bigger. Maybe we'll, we'll eventually reach a 12 strings guitar. Just or maybe, no, bigger. Maybe even bigger, yes. So that's going to be a journey for Usopp. But having all those instruments was absolutely essential also because the show is so elaborate and it's eight episodes featuring pretty much eight hours of music. It's a lot of material and it's very easy to get lost when there is so much going on. So having a very cohesive narrative, not only on screen, but also musically, it's absolutely imperative for a complex show like this. But also because it gives us so much fun writing for it also, because like, you know, this approach is not just for the main characters, but also for all the villains. The Going Merry has its own theme. Like, for example, we hear uh, the Going Merry theme when Luffy first sees the Going Merry, right? But then in episode eight, when they're doing the Barrow Pledge, that whole scene starts with the Going Merry theme. And then on top, when we have each character saying what, what they what they're pledging, we have each character's instrument or snippets of his theme on top of the going Mary blending all together. So so it's all about creating that dialogue. Just as there is a dialogue on screen, there is a dialogue happening musically, and that's what makes all of this cohesive and unified. Like one in one piece. In one piece, yes. <laughs> so with all these instruments, are these all things that you've used before? Like, did you have to to learn anything new in order? Yes. To or, or like Google it. I, mean, I sacrifice myself with mandolin. That oh, oh my, so I, I'm not. I'm originally a drummer, right? But I uh, play drums. Then I started playing piano. And then during the, the pandemic, I start, I pick it up. I started learning guitars, bass, old uh, string instruments. So for here, I was like, oh, it would be cool to do mandolin. Oh my gosh, those strings on the mandolin are so thin. They cut so much through it. I was like, this is a torture, this instrument. 
So we did mandolin. Then you also recorded some ukuleles. Some oh, ukuleles. For ukuleles, we had an incredible soloist. His name is Johan Frank, and he's just fantastic. Mm-hmm. But there were a couple of scenes where we didn't really need Johan, and it was just about like some textures and other cool things. So Johan... Oh, some weird melodic, but a bit of chromatic that I can do very easily. Since yeah. So Johan took over ukulele. Uh, what else? Uh, we did uh, some other percussion, like we started mastering more like bongos, congas, all that stuff. We already after The Witcher, we were able to assemble such a huge collection of instruments. Uh, the what? pong drum. Oh, it's throughout the oh, whole. Hang on, hang on. So, after The Witcher, see, th- there's a lot. <laughs> we were able to assemble such a huge collection of instruments. Like, we literally pretty much don't have any space in the studio. But if after The Witcher, there was still some space. Now there's no more space in the studio. And the way you walk through the studio, there's kind of like a pathway and you go like that because it's just full of instruments. So uh, beyond mandolin and ukulele, which were new for this project, we also got a bunch of drums. So we have very specific bongos and congas that we're using throughout the score. Then we have a steel tongue drum. Yes. That's how it's called? No, that's an idiopan. Okay, which one? But then we also have the tongue drum, the poop, 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 poop. the log drum. The log drum. Okay, so it's an instrument. It's it's weird because it has many, many titles. If you Google it, it's like you're gonna see it under different titles. I think the most common is the the log drum. Right. Uh so it's literally like um it's a it's a rectangular piece of wood. It's like a box with uh tongues cut into it. Yeah, and you can produce so many different sonorities. And the cool thing about it, it sounds very kind of peculiar. And maybe slightly off, but very quirky, which was just perfect for this show. And then, you know, on The Witcher, uh, Sonia had basically all the vocal solos, but on One Piece, it was my opportunity (laughs) (laughs) to show off my vocal capabilities. Not only we realized I can sing higher than Sonia in octaves. Fact. Facts. Uh, But we put it like, yeah, so if on The Witcher, it was mainly me doing all the background vocals because we needed that kind of magical, witchery sonority. Are you trying to say that I don't, I don't sound magical when I sing? As much as everybody loves you, Jonah, probably not. <laughs> uh, so on one piece, that was Jonah's opportunity, his opportunity to truly shine with his vocals. Yeah. And for example, in episode one, when there there is a courtyard fight and they're fighting Captain Axe Morgan, this is where Jonah's vocal talents are in the forefront. Yeah, and I remember when we were recording it, like with a few takes, and you know, it's different stacks, like one octave, then octave higher. And I remember someone's like, do it one more. I'm like, two more of this. <laughs> Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, uh, well, her, back to Hurdy Gurdy for a second. Yes, we used Hurdy Gurdy on The Witcher. We used it quite a bit. But think about Hurdy Gurdy. It's actually a, an incredibly versatile instrument. Mm. Uh, it was created in medieval Europe, like 13th, 14th century. And it was mainly used to accompany dances. And the way we used it in The Witcher uh was more or less in its traditional sense because we have a lot of dances when Siri is at Sintra. So it's it sounds in its more traditional way. Mm. Now with one piece, we really went all the way. And beyond, for example, using Hurdy Gurdy for Luffy, we also use Hurdy Gurdy for Kuro, which is one of our villains and the captain of the Black Cat Pirates crew. But we use it in such a way it's used in a combination with a shrieking dulcimer. And when you put them together in such a particular way, the sound that they produce really sounds like cats meowing. And because Kuro is the captain of Black Cat's Pirate, having that cat meowing type of sound was just perfect for him. In fact, when we send that track to the team, Matt and Steve were like, guys, do you have a cat in the studio? Like, <laughs> did you record a cat? Uh, we're like, no. Gertie. Uh, and also for Kuro, because, you know, his uh, trademark I don't know, uh, well, uh, weapon uh, are the claws. Yeah, he has this very iconic look with his iconic claws. So we had to find a way how to incorporate that musically. And we were like, what better way than recording when, you know, the sound of when you're sharpening knives, like a chef sharpening knives. So we grabbed knives and we started sharpening in front of a mic. It was tricky trying to figure out not how to cut the microphone in the process. But... Well, good news, no composers were heard in the process and no microphones were heard in the process. <laughs> uh, 
Back to Jonas' vocal talents. We forgot about Buggy. Yes. Uh, that's another thing, because Buggy, another one of our main villains, he's yes. such a fantastic villain. He is really a very powerful villain, but also an unhinged clown. So there is that whole circus vibe about him going on. And we really had to find a circus way to represent his theme, but mm -hmm. with a cool twist. So what we do for Buggy is we have Buggy's theme, uh, and that theme features a really fast-paced riff. Uh, Buggy's signature move is chop-chop because he can chop his body into multiple parts, right? So when he does his signature move, it's like chop-chop. Cannon. Cannon, right? Uh, so the idea was what if we literally incorporate chop chop into his musical theme so when you hear that riff going like ta -ta 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 -ta, if you pay attention what you actually hear is chop -chop 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 -chop. wow yeah, we recorded. Feature, feature enjoy. Yeah, I recorded yeah. myself doing chop, 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 chop. We recorded, stack it, and in like voices of different pitches, stacking that together, and you get buggy. Chop, 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 chop. So, and then another one, you know, for both the more like a very uh precise direction from Matt and Steve was that you know for the straw hat just to use acoustic instruments. We don't want to use any electronic instruments whatsoever. But for the Marines and also Ireland, we can use uh, electronic instruments because for the Marines, they're more technological advanced. So we can use electric guitar or synthesizers. So we uh, we got a couple of uh, hardware synthesizers and we had fun with that. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. No space in the studio at all. <laughs> no, of course. That's incredible. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, so I'll ask like a couple quick ones. But I'm curious, like, do you guys have, I mean, now that this is all out and it's all done and like everything, do you have a favorite cue from the soundtrack if you if you had to pick? It's four hours long. I know. <laughs> it's like you're my dragons, you're my babies. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there's like the like obviously well fame power for me, or well fame power is really cool because it's Roger's theme and Luffy's theme and Luffy's theme, which is the main theme of the show, it's a reversed version of Roger's theme because their characters, they have kind of, they have some similarities and similar character traits between the two. So it just made sense to find some similarities between their themes and the way to do it was by reversing them. Or like, for example, the track called Let's Disappear, which is how episode of five opens up or well, oh. obviously, my sales are set because Aurora is just brilliant, and we're so happy that we found our musical Nami because we were looking for a global artist who is really a global presence who would be able to portray such a complex character because there's so much to Nami. On one hand, she is a brilliant and sharp thief and navigator and a total badass, but then on the other hand, there's so much depth to her character and there's, you know, a very dramatic past and a childhood trauma. So we needed an artist who would really be able to encapsulate all these different nuances of that character while sounding fragile and emotional, but at the same time being also able to sound very powerful. And Aurora was exactly that artist. And, you know, from when she starts the song, she sounds so fragile and so delicate. But then when we get to the last chorus and that there is that powerful chanting, she really gave it all. And I, I love that song and I love working with Aurora. Oh, so the scene in episode three when we cut from Nami and Kaya talking, we have the flute uh, and oboe duet moment. Then we cut I think to the track is called uh, Kaya... Kaya and Usopp. Yeah, and then we cut to Usopp and Luffy talking in the kitchen and we go into the bluesy, rocky ukulele and then we cut back to Nami and then we cut back to Usopp and Luffy and then when you Luffy realizes who's Usopp's father and we go into this heroic rendition of the same, every time I get goosebumps, I'm like, yes! I love that track because that's a great way of musical storytelling because just as there is a dialogue happening on screen between different characters, there is exactly the same dialogue happening musically within their instruments. And as we cut to different characters, that instrumentation changes according to those characters. So, like, I just love the intricacy of that scene. Uh, or uh, me. Hawk versus Azora versus Mihawk featuring Marcin. I mean, that's first of all, we love Mihawk. Steve, Steve Ward, who is the actor who portrayed Mihawk. I mean, he he's just brilliant. 
And as soon as we saw Mihawk on screen, we knew that we had to get the artist who would be able to portray all the awesomeness that Mihawk is delivering on screen and translate that into music. And we knew right away, even before we started writing music, we knew that it had to be Marcin. And how he, what he brought into his performance, it's just like, it's his 1000% and I love the track. The, obviously this is not being written, it's not being filmed right now, like a season two, we don't know anything, but like clearly you two have gone above and beyond already. Like, are you already writing music that you want to include in future seasons? <laughs> I want a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> it's, as of right now it's a very type of uh, uh silent type of music very relaxing and <laughs> yeah like when you go on spotify and you click like lounge ambient music white noise white noise <laughs> that, that's it right now <laughs> no but you know there are obviously but ideas are happening 